Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. Today is Thursday, October 7, 2021. And today it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Sylvia Mayer. Sylvia is an arbitrator, mediator, and attorney with nearly 30 years of experience in federal court, state court, bankruptcy court, and the American Arbitration Association, as well as the International Center for Dispute Resolution. Since 2014, Sylvia has served as neutral arbitrating and mediating um, neutral over 500 disputes involving in excess of $1 billion in value, as well as having served as counsel in various arbitrations and mediations over the last 30 years. She does both in-person, online, and hybrid mediation and arbitrations. Uh, when I read her bio, I, it occurred to me that I didn't actually know how to, to quantify, how to, to value, how to measure what a billion dollars was. So I looked it up and here's what I found. Uh, if you convert dollars to time, for example, seconds, a million dollars is 11 and a half days, give or take. A billion dollars is 31 years. That's the difference between a million dollars and a billion dollars, 11 days versus 31 years. And if you jump that up even further to a trillion, it is 31,000 years. So when we talk about Sylvia having uh, worked with assets in excess of a billion dollars, that's how big that number is. Really impressive. Sylvia, we're glad to have you with us today. We're going to turn the floor over to you and let you introduce to us your topic and your food bank of choice, please. Absolutely. Thank you, Natalie. I, I truly appreciate the opportunity to join you all today. I, in terms of uh, food banks, I am a, a supporter of the Houston Food Bank. I live in Houston, Texas, and I donate to them regularly and volunteer as well. But I encourage you to donate to people who are hungry anywhere. Uh, so you, if you choose to donate to the Houston Food Bank, that's fantastic. Uh, but please just make sure people have food in their bellies because that is the first step in helping people move forward. In terms of my topic today, we're going to talk about business bankruptcy mediation, uh, which I often say is like a Rubik's Cube sometimes. Okay. so. Um, as I said, we're here to talk about business bankruptcy mediation and how it's really kind of like a Rubik's Cube some of the time. In order to understand what I'm talking about here, I'm going to give you a, a, a two minute bankruptcy 101 because you really have to understand what this world is. And I often say in the context of anything, where I, whether I'm wearing my lawyer hat, my mediator hat or my arbitrator hat, that vocabulary is the key uh, to opening the door uh, to most topics. So here's some basic vocabulary and what these things mean. In the bankruptcy code, you have different chapters that govern the type of bankruptcy that's going to occur. Chapter seven is for liquidation. Chapter nine is for municipalities. Chapter 11 is uh, for reorganizations, although some can also be liquidations. And chapter 13 is for wage earners. Today we're talking about business bankruptcies in the context of a chapter 11. And so that's really the focus. But many of the terms that we're going to cover are applicable across the line, uh, or across the board rather, to all the different types of bankruptcy. So you start a bankruptcy case by filing a petition. And uh, either it's a voluntary petition or if a group of creditors come together, sometimes it's an involuntary petition. But that starts the bankruptcy case. And so people often refer to the petition date because it draws a line in the sand between the debt that was owed, whatever amount of money the debtor owed prior to the petition, and whatever amount of money the debtor may owe going forward because this thing called an automatic stay goes into effect the minute that the petition is filed and says people can't try to collect what they're owed prior to the petition date. In a chapter 11 case, you're going to have a plan. That plan can be a document that describes how the company is going to reorganize or how the company is going to liquidate or a combination of the two. 
The plan is basically a contract between the debtor and the creditors that determines how they're going to pay them. Depending on the bankruptcy, you may or may not have a discharge. You see discharge a lot in consumer or individual bankruptcy cases, and it's also a factor in commercial bankruptcies. It is um, something that is frequently litigated and therefore mediated uh, more in the consumer world than in the commercial world. Debtor or dip and dip or loan. So this is something that I, I also happen to teach a uh, bankruptcy 101 class uh, to a uh, law school class that studies bankruptcy tax issues. And I always tell them uh, dip may not mean what you think it means because when a debtor files chapter 11, they are referred to as a debtor in possession and people refer to them by the acronym sometimes of dip or debtor in possession. But the debtor in possession may obtain a loan after it files bankruptcy, and frequently people refer to that loan as dip financing. So anytime you're talking to people in bankruptcy and they use the phrase dip, just make sure you understand if they're talking about the debtor or the financing. Creditor. A creditor is somebody who is owed money. It's as simple as that. If they're owed money prior to the bankruptcy filing, then they are a creditor. I talked about the automatic stay already, and now let's get to one of the most important issues, which is claim. Uh, that is when somebody says they're owed money. So a creditor holds a claim for the money they are owed, and they may need to file a document called a proof of claim to prove that up. Lastly, avoidance actions in our Bankruptcy 101 here. Those are lawsuits that often get filed in Chapter 11 cases to essentially claw back money and other assets into the estate uh, because when you file bankruptcy, you create an estate. And those are ways uh, that the bankruptcy code allows the debtor uh, to recover assets to try and increase the pie that everybody's fighting over in terms of how claims are going to be paid. So that uh, is your Bankruptcy 101. I realize I went fast. I hope uh, people uh, were able to follow along and that that'll help you understand what I'm going to be talking about. <clears throat> Until debt tear us apart. Really, this is the underlying issue throughout a bankruptcy case, whether it's consumer or commercial. Unpaid debt is a disruptor. And a company that cannot pay its debt because it doesn't have enough cash on hand now or enough value in order to ultimately pay everybody uh, creates a disruption, uh, sometimes in the marketplace if it's a big enough case, but at least for those who are affected by the bankruptcy case. In a bankruptcy, we have a what is called a waterfall, which means an order of priority in terms of which creditors can get paid. And at a very simplistic level, at the top of the food structure are secured creditors, uh, then come unsecured creditors, and then come equity holders. Unsecured creditors are divided into two categories. Congress has determined that there are certain unsecured creditors who have priority. Uh, the good news for bankruptcy attorneys is uh, that uh, counsel to the debtor and counsel uh, for any organizations that or any groups that are appointed by the court are paid uh, on a priority basis, but so are uh, some portion of employee wages, uh, certain taxes, and some other items get priority treatment, even though they are unsecured creditors. Uh, another acronym that you will frequently hear in a bankruptcy case is GUC, which is an acronym for General Unsecured Creditor. And that is basically the unsecured creditors who are not priority. And last in line is always the equity holders. All right, so that's really, I guess, essentially some more bankruptcy 101, but it leads us to what are the types of disputes that we mediate in a bankruptcy case? So there's a lot of two-party disputes in a bankruptcy. Sometimes those two-party disputes are claims. So you may remember that I said a creditor who is owed money has a claim in a bankruptcy. They may file a proof of claim. That creditor may say, I'm owed $10 million. And the debtor may say, no, you're not. You're owed $500. 
So they may negotiate that and work it out, or uh, they may litigate that and have the judge make a determination, or they may go to mediation. Uh, depending on what part of the country you're in, mediation is now heavily ingrained in the bankruptcy practice, or uh, it's something that's still new and emerging, and uh, it varies by court and sometimes by jurisdiction. So oftentimes, two-party disputes are claims litigation, or the other big thing I discussed in the Bankruptcy 101 section, avoidance actions. And avoidance actions, you can see in a large Chapter 11 case, they could file 100, 200, 300, 400 avoidance actions. Frequently, those avoidance actions are what are called preferences, which is a lawsuit that is filed to claw back what was paid to a creditor in the 90 days prior to the bankruptcy as a way to, to level the playing field. So if one creditor got, filed, got paid on the eve of bankruptcy and another creditor did not, the, the policy underlying preference is that they, the one who got paid should put the money back in the bucket and then everybody can share uh, based on what the bankruptcy waterfall and what is negotiated in the plan provides. What is interesting in a bankruptcy case is sometimes in these two-party disputes, there's actually a third party. So in a Chapter 11 bankruptcy, it is possible that an unsecured creditors committee will be formed. The U.S. Trustee's Office is an arm of the Department of Justice, and they have the opportunity to appoint an unsecured creditors committee that is assigned to protect and defend the uh, rights of unsecured creditors as a group, uh, not the individual unsecured creditors uh, on an individual basis, but to exercise fiduciary duties to try and look out for the interests of unsecured creditors on a whole. And again, I will say, I am, I am oversimplifying a lot of very complicated issues, but the point here is sometimes you have a two-party dispute, but you actually have three parties. Uh, because you have the debtor on one side and the creditor on the other, and you may have the creditors committee representative there as well. In some instances, particularly avoidance actions, the debtor is no longer engaged in the process. And instead, frequently avoidance actions get put into a trust uh, and there is a litigating trust or litigating trustee who is pursuing those claims. So you will have the litigation trustee on one side and the creditor on the other, and you may or may not have the creditors committee. Occasionally, you will also have, uh, perhaps instead of the creditors committee or in addition to the creditors committee, uh, you may have a secured creditor who has a seat at the table in negotiating claims and or avoidance actions. So while those tend to be the categories for two-party disputes, the sort of strange wrinkle in a bankruptcy case is some two-party disputes are actually three or four-party disputes. Uh, and um, you have a lot of competing concerns that underlie your potential resolution. In contrast to mediating a two-party dispute outside of bankruptcy, where if plaintiff agrees to accept from defendant a payment of $100, then plaintiff can expect to get $100. In a bankruptcy case, that's not how it works. What you're, you may be negotiating is how much, if we're talking about a claims dispute, how much the creditor's claim will be, but that claim then gets paid out pursuant to the terms of the plan. And we're going to talk more about the plan in a minute. And so we refer to that in bankruptcy oftentimes as it will be paid in bankruptcy dollars. So in a, say, a uh, slip and fall case where somebody is going to get paid $100,000 that's outside of bankruptcy, they actually get $100,000. If that slip and fall were determined in the bankruptcy case through mediation, and now it is going to be paid as an unsecured claim under the plan, and if the plan provides that unsecured creditors get a 10% recovery on their claims, that $100,000 slip and fall claim is only going to get paid $10,000.
And so that is an interesting wrinkle that you will see in bankruptcy cases. There's a similar interesting wrinkle, sort of the inverse for the avoidance actions, because oftentimes there are added layers to what you're, you're fighting about. You're not just, the parties aren't just fighting about, do I or don't I have to give that cash or that asset back? They are also fighting about, if I give it back, do I get a claim in the bankruptcy? Because remember underlying preferences, the policy concept is to equalize the playing field amongst the creditors. So I'll, will I replace what I got paid with a claim for what I got paid? And how does it affect payment on any remaining claims that that creditor has? So there are definitely some, some nuances to a two-party dispute in a bankruptcy case uh, that you don't see outside of bankruptcy. But a lot of bankruptcy mediation is not a two-party dispute. And here is where we get to the Rubik's Cube. A lot of bankruptcy mediation is multi-party. And you can have three parties, 10 parties, 20 parties, 100 parties, 500 parties. You can have as many parties as you can imagine. You may not have all of those parties, or you probably won't have all of those parties at your mediation. You will likely have a subset of the key players who attend the mediation, some of whom may be representing large groups. So for example, I talked about the creditors committee. You would, in a chapter 11 mediation dealing with some of the more complex issues, you would definitely have the unsecured creditors committee sitting with a seat at the table in the mediation. But you might also have an ad hoc bondholder group. Uh, and so while they are unsecured creditors, in this case, if we assume that these bondholders are unsecured, uh, they may technically be represented by the unsecured creditors committee, but they may have divergent itch interest from some of the trade creditors. So that bondholder group may have a seat at the table representing multiple holders of bonds. You might have a party who holds claims but also has a different interest in the case who wants a separate seat at the table. Perhaps they wanna acquire some of the assets from the, from the debtor. You may have uh, parties who are secured. You could have multiple parties who are secured who are fighting over whose secured claim comes first and whose secured claim attaches to which assets. You, there are a gajillion permutations on this theme but the idea is you have a lot of people at the table who have competing interests and a lot of uh, different issues that may or may not affect each of the parties, but once you put all the puzzle pieces together, affects the whole. The type of issues that you frequently see mediated in this context, um, first I will digress and say, sometimes you'll mediate these things outside of bankruptcy, and I have done that, out of court restructuring negotiations where the creditors say, look, if we can work this out amongst ourselves, we don't have to go into a bankruptcy court and we can save that time and money. And so you might have a mediation where you're dealing with all these same issues, but you are not in bankruptcy court at that time. But right now we're really focused on what's gonna happen in a bankruptcy case. So the types of issues that go to these types of multi-party disputes, um, these issues tend to be, uh, sometimes you will have operational issues. So perhaps early in the case, there's a lot of fighting over how is the debtor gonna use cash. And so you might have those types of issues early in the case. Uh, and need to mediate those in order to find a path for the company to move forward in its bankruptcy while it's working out how to pay creditors. You might have issues related to an asset sale. Perhaps everybody has agreed that some or all of the assets should be sold, but there's issues around how to structure that, or there's a uh, sale process that went awry, and so there could be issues that need to be mediated and resolved through that process. You could have challenges to liens. So remember I talked about there could be issues between different secured creditors who are arguing over who comes first and who comes second and whose lien is on which asset. But you may also have unsecured creditors who are challenging whether or not the secured creditors are in fact secured. 
And so it is not uncommon that you would have multi-party litigation that includes challenges to liens. And then lastly, you often see in multi-party mediations in commercial bankruptcies, issues related to the plan. So I've referred to the plan a couple of times. I said early on that this is basically the contract that describes what creditors will get paid uh, after the company comes out of bankruptcy or how they will get paid. And so there's oftentimes a lot of mediation that goes around what does that look like? And it is, it can be incredibly complicated. Uh, so this slide is here to show that it is a very complex puzzle. You could have multiple issues. I just went through a whole bunch of different issues. You could actually have all of those issues in one mediation where the parties are arguing about, should we sell assets? If we sell assets, which assets do we sell? How do we sell them? They might be arguing about challenges to liens. They may be arguing about continued use of cash. They may be arguing about what does the plan look like. There could also be litigation in the bankruptcy case that is pivotal. There could be some central issue in the case, whatever it may be, that needs to be determined or resolved consensually in order to allow the parties to put a plan in place. And so you have all of these myriad of issues and different interests. So as mediators, we're often trying to understand, here's what you say you want, but I want to, as mediator, I wanna understand what you need. What is your underlying interest? And so in these complicated multi-party bankruptcy mediations, figuring out what the underlying interests are is often very complicated. And it gives people, the other thing is there are different leverage points for different people. And so what sometimes happens is maybe you work out something that resolves one issue for a couple of the parties or perhaps even all of the parties. But when you resolve that issue, it pushes some buttons and it changes the entire landscape. So there are constantly moving parts. And because there are constantly moving parts, there are also shifting alliances. And that's another thing that is unique uh, to bankruptcy cases, particularly complex commercial bankruptcy cases, that the alliances could be shifting throughout your mediation. So sometimes when you have a large commercial bankruptcy mediation, your med mediation may extend over more than one day. You might have two days, three days, four days, five days, whatever it is that that case needs. And those days could be consecutive or they may be spread out over time. And one of the things as a mediator that we are trying to figure out is, does everybody have the information do, that they need? Uh, and we're trying to understand the underlying interest. And so sometimes what will happen is you have a multi-party mediation and you determine that some parties don't have the information you need. We see that in mediations across the board. That's not something unique to commercial bankruptcy. That's something that I see in, in all kinds of, of mediations that I handle. But you need to put a process in place to make sure that people have the access to the information that they need in this, in this particular mediation. And so what happens sometimes is as that information is getting shared, alliances may be shifting. There may be negotiations that are happening behind the scenes that you as mediator don't know anything about as the information is being shared and the landscape is changing. And so you always want to make sure you have an open line of communication with the parties. One of the things that I think is critically important uh, for, for all of the complicated mediations that I handle, uh, but particularly when I'm doing a commercial bankruptcy case, is preparation. And I use that process to talk to the parties, not just to uh, build rapport, which is obviously an important part of it, but also to understand more what's going on behind the scenes. Where do the parties have their alliances? What are their underlying interests? And when I have a complex mediation that is going to extend over multiple days, then I, I in some cases, will continue to reach out to parties and talk to them in between the sessions because there are things happening during that gap in time 
that I may need to know about in order to help the parties uh, find their path to resolution. One of the really fantastic things about bankruptcy is the bankruptcy court is a court of equity, uh, which means that there is a tremendous opportunity for creativity. So uh, on some uh, level, it's all about the money. Bankruptcy cases are, we had a, we thought we had a pie that had X dollars, but really we only have half a pie in order to pay claims. And everybody is fighting to get as much pie as they can. But the reality is underlying that fight over the money are frequently a variety of other issues. Perhaps there are control issues that need to be thought through and addressed. Maybe someone wants to have a seat at the table to control pursuing avoidance actions after the company comes out of bankruptcy. Maybe uh, somebody wants to have control because they want to be involved in the ongoing operations after the company comes out of bankruptcy. Maybe there are business considerations that are pushing a party. Perhaps uh, they uh, want to acquire some of the assets of the debtor, or perhaps they want to make sure someone else doesn't acquire some of the assets. Perhaps this company where they're owed debt is somehow interrelated to a different company that they have a vested interest in. Now, you may not be able to discern all of these types of underlying issues in your conversations with the parties, but you always need to be aware that there are things that are going on behind the scenes and that it is not just about the money. You have tremendous creativity, as I said, in a bankruptcy, particularly a bankruptcy mediation. The parties can really start with a blank sheet of paper and negotiate whatever structure they want. So if the parties have come to you and they're trying to figure out what a plan should be, uh, frequently, well, I will say at the beginning when I ask parties uh, for confidential mediation statements, and I often do ask that they be kept confidential, is I say, assume you have a blank sheet of paper and you can, uh, put whatever, throw whatever spaghetti you want on the wall uh, to try and find a path forward. Uh, whether you think it's feasible or not, whether you think it would actually uh, be approved or be accepted by other creditors, just spitball. And uh, sometimes I get incredibly creative ideas from parties and we can pool some of those ideas together and come up with a path forward. Sometimes I'm able to draw on my almost 30 years of experience and say, well, I see that y'all have uh, these three pieces that there's general consensus around, but you're fighting over these two. Here are some things that I have seen in other cases that were ways to resolve those two things. And sometimes I can throw out uh, some spaghetti uh, and see if it sticks on the wall. Uh, but that's the thing that is really pivotal and a distinguishing factor in commercial bankruptcy mediation, which is that you really can be incredibly creative. I talked some about the plan and that the plan is what's going to is going to define how creditors get paid and what creditors get paid. Another unique aspect to this is creditors do not have to agree to the plan in order to be bound by it. The bankruptcy code has some requirements, some thresholds that have to be met in order for the plan to be approved by the court. In bankruptcy speak, we refer to that as confirmed. As long as they get those votes that are spelled out in the bankruptcy code and meet certain required provisions that are spelled out in the bankruptcy code, the debtor can force the plan on some dissenting creditors which is a really critical factor to be aware of if you're mediating a complicated bankruptcy dispute that involves multiple parties, particularly if the plan is part of the discussions. Because it may be that you have, fill in the blank, 10 different key constituencies sitting around the table, eight of them build a consensus around something. The other two are holdouts, but it is possible 
that what will happen is the eight who have built a consensus will determine that they can get their plan confirmed if the other two are left out. Now, obviously, as mediator, our hope is that we can help the parties find a path to resolution that includes everyone who sat around the table. But sometimes in bankruptcy, that's not how it works out. Uh, and sometimes what will happen is those two outliers will see the way the tide is rolling and they will then start making concessions and it will result in some tinkering around the edges of what the other eight have agreed to. And you will ultimately end up with something that all 10 of the key constituencies agreed to. But there are a tremendous amount of uh, variables that go into a bankruptcy mediation. And sometimes just like everything else, um, the underlying fight uh, is something that perhaps you need to take a break and there's a key issue that the court needs to decide uh, before you can move forward with negotiating the other things. And um, that is just, unfortunately, sometimes there's a roadblock about around one issue and you cannot get that one issue resolved as a way to break the log jam to move on to the other issues. So I've touched on some of this already. Here's the truth. The truth is oftentimes in a multi-party bankruptcy mediation uh, that has complicated issues, it is a quagmire. And you start out in a fog uh, with as many different potential permutations that all of the collective minds around the table could possibly think of. And you use the process to try to work through this and to find opportunities to build consensus between parties, uh, to understand what the underlying interests are between the parties so that you can help them develop a path to resolution. And I, I tend to use the phrase path to resolution in all of my mediations because it, it is, in my mind at least, that's what parties are doing. When you are mediating, you are working your way from being on opposite sides of the road to working together to find a path to help you resolve your dispute. Whether or not uh, that's the path that anyone wanted to take, uh, the goal is to find a path that, that all of the participants are willing to take. And so you find yourself in a bankruptcy mediation sometimes lost in this quagmire or fog, unable to see any of the paths. And as you work through the issues with the parties and you build consensus amongst different constituents uh, or amongst all constituents around a particular issue uh, or a particular component of resolution, then the fog may lift and you start to find a pathway forward. And sometimes what happens is you're able to put a framework in place that helps the parties navigate next steps. And even if you have not resolved all of the issues, you have given them the framework that allows them to ultimately find their resolution. And I wanna go back to something I mentioned before. Really the groundwork for that is laid in the preparation. And uh, so we as ADR professionals, I uh, have uh, the opportunity to prepare on our side. I read what people send, I talk to the parties, I try to understand the case and the interests and um, what their drivers are, what their concerns are, or what some of the competing interests are. Uh, and, uh, but the onus is not only on us, it is also on the participants. It is critically important that Attorneys come, particularly in a commercial bankruptcy mediation, come prepared that they and their clients have come to the mediation understanding the case, understanding the moving parts, understanding the legal issues, the factual issues, the competing interests, but also understanding why we're here. And that I think is something that people sometimes lose sight of is they just move their advocacy from the courtroom to the conference room uh, to try and mediate. And it is really important that the parties find a way to pivot from advocacy to working together to try to find a path to resolution. 
clearly uh, part of that burden lies on us as ADR providers. We as mediators are there to try to help the parties find their way to move from being adversarial to trying to work together. Uh, but it also does require participants to be open to doing that. And you know, there, I think those of us who are ADR providers are certainly familiar with all of the different psychological barriers to resolution, you know, advocacy bias and different cognitive barriers. And it's important to, for us to try to help the parties work their way through those issues as well. And so you'll find in a complex commercial mediation that sometimes the fog that needs to lift is not the fog that is around the complicated substantive issues that you might see in the case. Perhaps the fog that needs to lift is not around the shifting dynamics between the parties, but it's the fog that needs to lift that the parties need to understand it is time to get in the boat and row together in order for everyone to get something rather than everybody being at cross purposes so that no one gets anything. And uh, that is frequently a crossroads that I see in many of my commercial bankruptcy disputes. Sometimes people come to me before they are ready. It is simply not ripe for them to be willing to row together. And oftentimes that will happen when there is a major um, legal issue that is teed up before the court and none of the sides uh, can truly appreciate the risk that they face on it. Each side or all sides, uh, depending on how many sides there may be on that issue, uh, may be 100% convinced of their likelihood of success. And this can be a barrier to resolution. And sometimes you need to uh, try to help the parties put a framework around how that's going to work. Sometimes you can get a framework in place that says, okay, you have all agreed you're going to roll the dice on this issue, but let's put a framework in now so that we can put parameters around what win and lose mean. And that way, once you have a ruling on the issue, you have a path to resolution. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't work. I, I had a mediation a couple of years ago where there was a significant issue teed up for litigation that no one, everybody was immovable forces on how this was, would play out. Uh, they were all 100% convinced they would win. But we were able to identify a myriad of other issues that all of the parties had interest in. And so while we were not able to resolve this pivotal legal issue, we were able to resolve 10 or 15 other issues that were significant factors in the, the larger dispute. So that once they got a ruling on the one legal issue, they had a framework uh, that they could then apply as they moved forward. And sometimes that's how it works out. Those of us who are mediators know that while we would love to settle every case, and I promise you that at least for me, uh, it's the cases that don't settle that haunt me uh, for years sometimes. Um, the reality is it's not always uh, a case that we can settle because sometimes the participants are not ready to find the path to resolution. And uh, while we may strive very hard to lead them in that direction uh, and to help them uh, get there and get their mindset around it, uh, sometimes we simply can't get there. And so then we need to fall back to what are other ways we can help? Are there other issues we can help them resolve? Are there frameworks we can put around it? Can we take a pause in the mediation and come back to it when some of the fog has lifted uh, and they're ready to move forward because they have some greater clarity and now we can develop a pathway forward? It, is, it can be very complicated to do these cases. Um, sometimes I am asked, and I'm going to guess that we have some mediators on uh, the video today who do not have a bankruptcy background, and sometimes I'm asked by people, do I really need somebody who understands bankruptcy in order to mediate my dispute? And the answer is maybe. Uh, you probably need somebody who understands bankruptcy to mediate a dispute that involves complicated bankruptcy issues. 
you may not need somebody who understands bankruptcy to, uh, for example, mediate a two-party claims dispute. It's the same thing as mediating that same dispute as if it happened outside of bankruptcy. The thing that is different is that it's going to get paid in bankruptcy dollars. And it just really depends on what it is that the parties need for that particular mediation. Hopefully from today's presentation, you, uh, if nothing else, now have some basic vocabulary. Uh, so you'll understand some of the questions that you can ask and you'll know some of the words to year, use when you're discussing it. I have uh, had the opportunity and good fortune to mediate a myriad of bankruptcy cases um, so I, as was mentioned before, I practiced law for uh, basically 20 plus years uh, with, a, with a large law firm and then started a solo and ADR practice in 2014. And so um, I had the opportunity for 20 years to be in the attorney seat. And since I started my solo law and ADR practice, I have now worn all hats. I have been attorney and mediator, and um, while not as relevant to bankruptcy, um, have been arbitrator as well. And it has been very interesting to me to have the opportunity to change seats and to uh, sometimes be in the mediator seat, sometimes the arbitrator, and sometimes the attorney seat. It definitely changes your perspective on how the puzzle pieces fit together and what it is uh, that are some of the elements to get to a resolution. So I have done a whole lot of talking. And so I'm gonna pause now uh, so that I can take questions and I'm going to stop my share uh, and Take any questions you may have. I, I again want to thank you for the opportunity to join you today. What questions do folks have? Thank you, Sylvia. This has been fascinating. It is fascinating. We're um, a small enough group. If you want to just raise your hand, um, that would be great. If not, I do have a few questions, but let's see if anyone else wants to go first. Okay, Anna. Uh, Sylvia. Does the, does the final um, agreement, whatever the parties may eventually come to, then have to go through an approval process separately uh, before the bankruptcy court? That is a fantastic question, Anna. So the answer is sometimes. Um, so for example, in avoidance actions, it is very common, and sometimes in claims disputes, it is very common that there will be a court order or the plan will provide that there are thresholds that do not require any further approval and the parties can simply agree to it and you're done. In other contexts, it may need to go back to the court. So for example, if you're mediating a plan dispute, the parties are trying to figure out what the chapter 11 plan will say, that definitely has to go back to the court for approval. But some other, even two party disputes will need to go back to the court for approval. And your question raises another interesting issue in bankruptcy that I think is unique to bankruptcy which is confidentiality. So if the settlement has to be taken back to the court, there may need to be an articulation of why this settlement should be approved. And so while there is confidentiality in the bankruptcy process uh, to the extent uh, it is provided under applicable law or perhaps the court order that governs your mediation, uh, the parties may actually need you to help them mediate what will be disclosed. Uh, I had a mediation several years ago where we settled the case after a few hours and then spent most of the day uh, mediating what actually would be disclosed uh, as part of seeking court approval of the settlement. So very good question. Yeah, you know, it's fascinating because uh, once the word bankruptcy is uttered in the course of a regular mediation that is not in a bankruptcy case, it seems like everything changes, you know, either it's there as a threat, we might have to declare bankruptcy. So let's try and get this settled. Or maybe someone who was willing, a plaintiff who was willing to accept a payment plan may not be so willing to do that. You know, um, uh, I had one recently where the day before the mediation, there had been a, um, a bankruptcy filing that everyone thought would be dismissed. It wasn't. And it threw the whole thing into 
um, you know, disarray. These were not bankruptcy lawyers and um, plaintiffs still wanted to try and settle or this, that, and the other thing, but it got very complicated and that ended up having to be put on hold. Would you say that if, if there's a surprise bankruptcy that gets filed right before you go into mediation, what, what, anything in particular that the parties or the mediators should consider at that point? So that depends on the particular case. So if, for example, you were going to mediate a um, single asset real estate issue. So um, you have, I'm going to make a fact pattern up, an apartment complex uh, that has a mortgage and it's defaulted on the mortgage and the mediation is over that default mortgage. And the day before the mediation, the debtor, meaning the apartment complex, files a bankruptcy, which is called, there's a special provision in the bankruptcy code. We refer to it as SARS, a single asset real estate bankruptcy. It owns, it's a, it's typically, it's an LLC that owns that one apartment complex. Well, that uh, changes things because now you have an automatic stay in place that creditor cannot collect, but you have an, a pivotal issue in the case, which is you're going to have to resolve that mortgage in order for that company to have bankruptcy. So if the parties are open to continuing with the mediation, recognizing that it's in the context of a bankruptcy now, and either working towards uh, what the bankruptcy resolution would be, or working towards a consensual dismissal of the bankruptcy case because you've resolved uh, the pending foreclosure and the, or the debt default, that's one way to handle it. I would say in that situation, you probably do want to encourage both sides to have somebody at the table who's familiar with bankruptcy. Because if they're not, then y'all could be mediating something that will not ultimately be able to survive scrutiny. In contrast, if you had a slip and fall uh, in a case and uh, for some really big, large company, and you are scheduled to go to mediation the day after they filed bankruptcy, that will be stayed and you are unlikely to be able to go forward. Ultimately, it is very likely in a slip and fall case that that will be lifted later uh, because frequently those slip and fall cases are covered by insurance and some, it is not uncommon, doesn't always happen, but not uncommon that in a bankruptcy case, uh, the debtor will get approval to allow those kinds of insurance covered uh, personal injury disputes to just go on their merry way outside of bankruptcy as long as insurance is paying the claim. Uh, so the short answer to your question is maybe. <laughs> that's a typical good, that's a, a lawyer-like question or answer, I should say. Yes, indeed. Well, thank you so much. Uh, before we run out of time, let me just um, bring everybody current here on uh will work for food, the, where we are that we know of with donations uh, that people have made to food banks around the world. Um, it's just so amazing. And as of today, Natalie advises me that she's been told of $182,830 worth of donations, or not worth, donations, period. And that is so exciting to think that our little group um, as global as we are, have, have raised that kind of money uh, during the pandemic and today. And uh, that is well over two million. Uh, and again, it can translate to 10 million based on the buying power of some food banks uh, to, you know, maybe a dollar a meal or something uh, like that. So do the math and uh, it is just an amazing, amazing thing. The, um, and, and thank you, of course, for your generosity and thank you for making World Work for Food such a success and to have it become more known um, in the community. Whether people donate or not, it's just wonderful thing for our community to uh, be able to have this. And we're so grateful to Sylvia today, thank you. And let's see, your food bank that you such uh, proposed was the um, the Houston, Houston Food, Food Bank, Bank right? Okay, Houston Food Bank, and and thank you again for the opportunity to present today. I really enjoyed it, and this is y'all do a great job with this program. I've I've had the opportunity to watch many, and uh, so thank y'all for all you're doing for people who are hungry and for educating all of us. Yeah, I like to say we, we educate our minds. 
or let's see, we feed our minds while feeding the world, right? So uh, feeding the hungry. So I love uh, that. Yeah. So unless anybody has another question here for Sylvia, I would say that uh, it's a wrap and we can get about our business or for the day or the evening, depending where you are in the world. I don't see any other questions. So thank you everyone for being here. And thank you so much, Sylvia. I learned a lot about bankruptcy laws. Thank you. Thank you.